There was no more perfect representation of the difference between facts and feelings about the history of the Democratic Party than this picture of Ralph North. When this picture surfaced, he admitted that this was he. Yet within a day's time, he stated that this was not him. Again, there is no more perfect representation of the history of the Democratic Party than this picture and the flip-flop that came shortly after. Let me explain. In the year of Someone's Invisible Sky Daddy 2019, if you ask almost any liberal or person who usually votes Democrat in elections what party is the party of equality, they will most likely answer the Democratic Party. This is due to several factors, some of which a lack of historical knowledge, education, indoctrination by liberal-leaning school systems, or just good old plain ignorance. Before you smash the dislike button with the assumption that I'm a Republican or voted for Donald Trump in 2016, assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. For most of my entire adult life, I have been a registered independent, a centrist that has leaned left, and I never once voted for a Republican candidate. After voting for Barack Obama twice, with the hope that his presidency would usher in a great era where things like racism would finally fall into the garbage can of history, I was dumbfounded when he had openly racist organizations like Black Lives Matter having brunch at the White House. No healing had happened, and in fact the divide had grown. I asked myself, why? I turned to the pages of history where facts don't give a damn about your feelings. The modern Democratic Party emerged in the late 1820s from former factions of the Democratic Republican Party, which had largely collapsed by 1824. It was built by Martin Van Buren who assembled a cadre of politicians in every state behind war hero Andrew Jackson of Tennessee. If you're not familiar with Andrew Jackson, a prominent man in American history, let me sum up just a few of his accomplishments. In his early years, Jackson was a frontier lawyer. He served briefly in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, representing Tennessee. He served as a justice in the Tennessee Supreme Court from 1798 until 1804. After this, he became a wealthy, slave-owning planter. It is estimated that during his life he owned as many as 300 slaves. In 1801, he was appointed colonel of the Tennessee militia and was elected its commander the following year. He led troops during the Creek War of 1813 to 1814, winning the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. The subsequent Treaty of Fort Jackson required the Creek surrender of vast lands in present-day Alabama and Georgia. In 1815, at the Battle of New Orleans, a victory against the British made him a national hero. Jackson then led U.S. forces in the First Seminole War, which led to the annexation of Florida from Spain. He ran for president in 1824 and became the seventh president of the United States. In 1830, Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, which forcibly relocated most members of the Native American tribes in the South to Indian Territory. The act authorized the president to negotiate treaties to buy tribal lands in the East in exchange for lands further West outside of the existing state borders. The act specifically pertained to the five civilized tribes in the South, the conditions being that they could either move west or stay behind and obey the law, effectively relinquishing their sovereignty. The forced removal of these indigenous peoples led to several thousand deaths on the infamous Trail of Tears. His successor, President Martin Van Buren, 1837 to 1841, Democrat, continued many of these policies set forth by his predecessor. He personally oversaw the endgame of the Indian Removal Act. He was anti-slavery and represented a divide in both parties. Despite this, he did almost nothing to help the abolitionist movement, and his presidency saw a continuation of pro-slavery legislation. So this video doesn't last an hour. Let's skip ahead to 1857. Dred Scott was a landmark decision by the United States Supreme Court on U.S. labor law and constitutional law. It held that a Negro whose ancestors were imported into the U.S. and sold as slaves, whether enslaved or free, could not be an American citizen, and therefore had no standing to sue in federal court, and that the federal government had no power to regulate slavery in the federal territories acquired after the creation of the United States. Dred Scott, an enslaved man who had been taken by his owners to free states and territories, attempted to sue for his freedom. In the 7-2 decision written by Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, the court denied Scott's request. The decision was only the second time that the Supreme Court had ruled an act of Congress to be unconstitutional. All seven that ruled in this case were Democrats, most of them Jacksonian Democrats. The two that ruled in favor of Scott were Republicans. 
1860, the Democratic Party was enabled to compete with the Republican Party, which controlled nearly all the northern states by bringing a solid majority in the Electoral College. The Republicans claimed that the northern Democrats were all accomplices to slave power. The Republicans argued that slaveholders, all of them Democrats, had seized control of the federal government and were blocking the progress of liberty. In the same year, the Democrats were unable to stop the election of Republican Abraham Lincoln into the presidency. The American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, the Union, also known as the North, referred to as the United States of America, and specifically to the national government of President Abraham Lincoln and the 20 free states, as well as four border and slave states. The Union was opposed by 11 southern slave states, or 13, according to the southern view of the Western Territory, that formed the Confederate States of America, also known as the Confederacy, or the South. The 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. In Congress, it was passed by the Senate on April 8, 1864, and by the House on January 31, 1865. The vote passed by the narrowest of margins, 119-4, with 56 against. Eight members abstained. Sixteen Democrats, all but two lame ducks, joined the full slate of Republicans in approving the measure. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution was adopted on July 9, 1868. This amendment addresses citizenship rights and equal protections of the law and was proposed in response to issues related to former slaves following the American Civil War. The amendment was bitterly contested, particularly by the states of the defeated Confederacy, which were forced to ratify it in order to regain representation in Congress. The amendment passed with 94% of the Republican vote while receiving no votes from Democrats. The 15th Amendment, giving freed slaves the right to vote, passed in 1870, 144-4, with 44 against, 35 not voting. The amendment received 100% Republican support and 0% Democrat support in Congress. The Ku Klux Klan, or KKK, was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee, sometime between December of 1865 and August 1866, by six former officers of the Confederate Army. The first incarnation of the Klan flourished in the southern states in the late 1860s and then died out in the early 1870s. It sought to overthrow the Republican state governments in the South during the Reconstruction era, especially by using violence against African American leaders. The Klan's activity infiltrated the Democrats' campaign for the presidential election of 1868 by its Grand Wizard Nathan Bedford Forrest and Southern Carolina's Wade Hampton, attending as delegates at the 1868 Democratic Convention, held in Tammany Hall headquarters at 141 East 14th Street in New York City. In the 1950s, Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower integrated the U.S. military and promoted civil rights for minorities. Eisenhower pushed through the Civil Rights Act of 1957. One of Eisenhower's primary political opponents on civil rights prior to 1957 was Lyndon Johnson, then the Democratic Senate Majority Leader. LBJ had voted the straight segregationist line until he changed his position and supported the 1957 Act. There are so many other points that can be gone over, but I implore you, the listener, to do some research for yourself. Get your information about history from as many unbiased sources as possible. They're out there. So, knowing now what I know about just some of the events that shaped the United States and as far as equality for our races, I think about the phrases that come out of liberal propaganda, I mean major news sources, that I completely understand why terms like Uncle Tom or Off the Plantation are regularly used in places like CNN. It's a strong part of their culture. Racism is a founding principle of the Democratic Party. This is what they do. If you dare to be a free thinker, or even more reprehensible, be a person of color, gods, I hate that term, we're all human, and you choose to be a Republican, then you have escaped the plantation. You have gotten away or refused to be indoctrinated into a systemic cycle of keeping you in your place. Don't think too much. Negroes shouldn't read books. Vote with us. We'll give you free shit and keep you nice and dependent. Don't worry. We'll let you know who to blame. This picture fully encompasses the Democratic Party, its history, and its thought process. This is what we are. My bad. Whoops. Nah, that wasn't me. These guys are are pointing the fingers at the Covington kids for wearing MAGA hats and calling them everything evil you can think of. Trail of Tears? No, no, no. Don't read that. Books are bad. History, bad. For any liberals that made it this far without going into convulsions or program errors, 
I salute you, and I can tell you this. You don't have to support this bigoted institution and think that you have to be a Republican. You don't. The two-party system sucks. You can be an independent or a centrist and actually choose which policies you agree and disagree with. I do it. I'm doing it right now. I just did it five minutes ago, and I'm ready to do it again. Moral of the story here is facts don't care about your feelings. The fact is, the Democrats, they are race peddlers. Always have been. The difference between now and then is that they went from saying it out loud and proud to using it as a tool to create confusion and dependency. They don't want you to succeed. They need you to be dependent upon them as Chicago, Philly, Baltimore, these epitomes of democratic leadership, crumbles around you so they can point the fingers at others and tell you who to blame. Don't be an ass. Be a wolf. This is Lodonis of Facts and Feelings asking you to like, comment, and subscribe. And please remember, be good to each other.